when this player receives force in this direction, that force gets transferred from the helmet to the skull directly to the cervical spine. And you can see here, without anything up underneath here to absorb those forces, they're all being distributed right towards the neck. With the Kerr collar in place, we're really reducing the area that was completely exposed to injury. The number one concern in football is head and neck safety. What we showed at Virginia Tech Center for Injury Biomechanics is that you can create a better environment during the collision between the head and neck area. What the study shows is that you can absorb some of the impact energy that gets created in a football collision and redistribute it away from the head and neck area. In the videos you will see without the Kerr collar in place you're getting tremendous lateral flexion and extension and rotation of the head. Those forces are causing the head and neck to move in a chaotic way. With the Kerr collar in place we see that it's a more controlled collision and the head and neck are not moving as far during the contact. This is a front collision. This is a collision that every player receives in football. In this video you'll see that as a hit comes directly to the top, the front part of the helmet, you're going to watch the force come down and then back. The head does not go back directly first. That is why there's nothing in the back of the Kerr collar because we understand that the head is tethered to the body by the neck. So when you talk about hyperextension of the head and neck during collision, we know that with the Kerr collar in place we're going to reduce hyperextension by first absorbing axial load this direction first and then what you're going to see in this video is that the head does not hyperextend as much as it would without the Kerr collar in place. So I'm going to run this video first. When you start to analyze the initial impact as that force is coming directly to the head, you're going to start seeing this downward direction and then you're going to get a shear force going backwards. When the Kerr collar is engaged in the helmet, the shear force of the head on the neck is less. Look at the back of the helmet here, this white piece of the bottom of the helmet. Look where it is when the Kerr collar is engaged as the impact force comes to the head. Look where it is here. In, without the Kerr collar in place, you're getting more of a push back. The force comes this way and back. As we pause this sequence, this is the same collision. But what we've seen is that when we pause it we see that the helmet here is not in the same position as it is without the Kerr collar in place. With the Kerr collar in place we see that the impact is absorbed better and the head does not rotate in this direction as far as it would without the Kerr collar. You see here we're looking at the collision sticker is here it's already almost off the screen versus look where it is directly in front right on top of the body in this one. But I also want you to look at look what the head is doing. That head is rotating in this direction hyperextending where in this, pic in this picture it does not. The overall experience between the head and neck during collision is better with the Kerr collar engaged with the helmet than without. So what we're looking at here is an oblique hit. As that impactor comes and we're watching the same hit in slow motion high speed camera, this hit is about a 75 g-force hit. What we're looking at is the Kerr collar engaged with the helmet versus not having the Kerr collar on at all. So the oblique hit is coming from the side, not directly from the front, but to the side of the football player's head. And we're going to just run this real quick. After the impact takes place, we want to stop the collision and look at where the head and neck are during the collision with and without the Kerr collar. You can see here that as we stop this, in this picture, when the helmet is engaged with the Kerr collar, we see that this white dot here has not moved as far as this white dot and the head is not rotated as far. 
So in this picture, we can say that the Kerr collar reduced lateral bending, which is the head going this direction, and we also reduced rotation of the head. You can see here that the helmet with the Kerr collar has very little lateral bending and very little rotation of the helmet. This is a lateral impact hit, so the force is directly coming from the side. And what we're looking at in this collision is how far the head laterally flexes. A lot of stingers take place because as that force, the player gets hit from the side, the head gets pushed in this direction. You can pinch the nerves on this side, but you also can stretch the nerves on this side. Now the important thing about when the Kerr collar is engaged with the helmet, we want to make sure that we can reduce how far that head is being driven over. So when we let this play, when we pause this lateral impact hit, we want to pick our markers up again. That's the top of the helmet here, it's this white marker, and then we have the white marker here. So during this collision, without the Kerr collar on, if we drop down directly from this marker here, we see that the center of the head is being pushed over here, way past this arm. With the Kerr collar in place, the center of the head is hitting here. So we use body parts as markers to see how far that head is actually driven over. As the Kerr collar is engaged in the helmet, you're absorbing that force which drives that head and causes the neck to laterally bend. So we know that in this collision, in this direct lateral collision, the head is being driven directly over as far as it can go. You see here with the Kerr collar in place, the head is not driven as far. The reason I did the study at Virginia Tech Center for Injury Biomechanics is to see if I could actually reduce head and neck movement during contact.